Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. Really appreciate you for doing that. Before I begin, again, just want to say this is not personal. Apart from religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, I hope everybody can just verify the information that's going to be presented. If you can sit through this video and allow me to show you all the information. And without getting emotions involved, hopefully you can discern and verify the historical, genealogical, real story of Thomas Drew. I say Thomas Drew because that was his real name and I'm going to show you guys. I get a lot of upset comments when I make videos like this. And that's okay. There's always somebody upset at every video I upload. It's nothing new. But based on your comments, I know whether you sat through the video or not, or you're just basing it all on emotions, on the thumbnail or in the title, and haven't really paid attention or verified any of the information. I'm hoping I'm talking to logical, wise people who are not just led blindly and purposely choose to practice cognitive dissonance. But with that said, I just want to say you can believe whatever you like, I can respect that. As long as you know that's a belief. And the rest of us who actually have done the investigation, which I'm going to present to you, are going to know the facts. But you can still practice and believe whatever you like. And I'm always going to respect that. Now, for those who are here for the facts, hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. The very first thing I wanted to point out about Drew Ali's uh, origins is how mysterious it's always been. All these legends, all these stories, I'm going to show you guys how everybody admits they really didn't know. At the same time, all these legends exist and different parents, like three sets of parents and all that. And there's a good reason for that. Because Noble Drew Ali himself was not open about his origin. And that's okay. I'm not judging him on that. So we're going to go over uh, some books that are going to cite these legends and different origin stories. And then we'll get into the actual historical records. So let's go ahead and begin with the video. All right. So again, we're going to begin with the myths of his origins. Just going to point these out. We're going to begin with this book. It says here, who was noble Drew Ali? By the pen of As Sayyid al-Iman Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. This is from 1980, and this is the author right here. And if you don't recognize him yet, he's also known as Dr. Malachi York. Dr. Malachi York of the Nawabian Nation. Yeah, I read the whole Holy Tablets. Very big book, long time ago. <laughs> so according to uh, Malachi York, right, says Timothy Drew, later to become known as Noble Drew Ali, was born January 8th, 1886, in North Carolina. Was he really? He was also referred to as Prophet Noble Drew Ali by some of his followers. One of the very elderly members of the Moorish Science Temple claims, all right, again, claims that on the day of his birth, there was a great earthquake. All right, there was a great earthquake. This was to have symbolized the so-called prophet spirit hid in the earth. All right, so you see, 
That was one of the myths. Born amongst the Cherokee Indian tribes of North Carolina, another one, young Timothy was put in the care of his aunt after the death of his mother. Little is known about his father, all right? They don't know anything about his father. And his early childhood is said to have been very tragic. It's said to have been. Again, where's all the sources and a lot of conjecture here? Before his mother passed, she had the feeling that her son would one day inherit a great mission. Therefore, she entrusted him in the care of her sister, who was very jealous of the child and abused him physically as well as mentally. So that's another of the childhood stories of Drew Ali, his aunt abusing him. A review of the so-called prophet Drew by one of his loyal followers stated that one day noble Drew Ali's aunt put the young baby in a burning furnace, leaving him to die. But Allah, most glorified and exalted in his unrelenting mercy, saved the child from the burning furnace and from that point on prepared him for the great work that he was to perform for his people, all right? And this became a legend. Does this sound familiar? Remember the story of Nimrod casting Abraham into the fire for seven days and how Allah, most glorified and exalted, and sent his heavenly host? So he continues uh, talking about a vision. You know, this is another a legend of him that one day, as it says here, now, Malachi York says, there are tales of his younger life having been spent with the gypsies and how one day when he was walking alone, the voice of Allah, most glorified and exalted, said, if you go, I will follow. The so-called prophet did not accept the job at first, but the voice kept saying, if you go, I will follow. Finally, he accepted his mission and he left the gypsy camp, never to return. This account was reported by Brother Claudius M.L., a Moorish Science Temple follower. So he said that. During his childhood in the early 1900s AD, he was a victim of racial discrimination, poverty, and suffering. Timothy was very intelligent and was always eager to listen to the wise. He was a boy of great bearing courage. As he grew older, he was very interested in the East, so with nothing to lose, he left the home of his aunt and began his journey toward manhood. Since he loved to travel, he first went to Egypt. While in Egypt, he learned of his heritage, which laid the foundation for his becoming a pioneer of al-Islam in the Western Hemisphere. He went to Egypt as Timothy Drew, and he returned to America with the Arabic name Ali. All right, so so again, I'm reading this so I can point out what the legends and the stories are, mainly in the Moorish science community about his origin. Uh, this is one of the main uh, storylines. And again, he just went to Egypt all on his own. They don't tell you how or why. Remember who was in Egypt by the name of Jamal? Of Ghani. It says here in Egypt, he had the opportunity to visit the great universities, sit with the Egyptian sages. What sages? Jamal of Ghani traveled through the inner chambers of the pyramids, remember his initiation, and also to learn the origin of the slave trade that took place from northern coast of Africa to America. Wait, I thought it was from West Africa. <laughs> Dodge the hijack. He was able to see and believe that his true way of life was all Islam and Allah most glorified and exalted is the creator of the original black man. By being in Egypt, he could see for himself that the black man had law, science, math, art, dignity, citizenship, and power over this land. All right, so so basically he got initiated that he met Jamal of Ghani, remember? So again, I just wanted to read this real quick. This is like one of the main storylines behind his origin and how he became noble Drew Ali. But is this all true? We'll see. Now I'm going to read from this book, Noble Drew Ali and the Moorish Science Temple of America, The Movement That Started It All by Sheikh Way El, The Foundation of Consciousness and Light in America. And right on page one, it says here, speculations about the prophet's early childhood. When I was born, it turned black dark in the daytime. The people put their hoes down and came out of the fields. Prophet Drew Ali. All right. He told people that he told people there was an eclipse. So now remember, there was an earthquake and now there was an eclipse as well. Now you see how the story builds up and the legend just gets bigger. Prophet Noble Drew Ali, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was born Timothy Drew in the state of North Carolina, January 8, 1886 AD. All right. We're going to see if that's true. There have been many speculations about the prophet's childhood being that there aren't any memories of his childhood as given by the prophet himself. Some of the accounts that come down to us appear to be rumors, conjectures, and mere speculation. 
I will attempt to relay some of these accounts that are floating about. His ancestry is variously described as him being the son of two former slaves who was adopted by a tribe of Cherokees. So this author, again, is going to go over some of the uh, rumors, conjectures, and speculations. His ancestry is variously described as him being the son of two former slaves who was adopted by a tribe of Cherokees, or that his parents were actually living on the Cherokee reservation when he was born in the Smoky Mountains region of North Carolina, or that he was the son of a Moroccan Muslim father and a Cherokee mother who was of Moorish descent. Some of those whom I call subversive Moorish groups try to say that the prophet was born in Monroe, Louisiana, but as noted in the Moorish Quran questionnaire, also called the 101s and the Keys, the prophet himself says that he was born in North Carolina, 1886, so that supposition is false. All right, now we're going to see how honest Mr. Noble Drew Ali was being. Some accounts say that the prophet's father was a dark-skinned native of the land and was a fine craftsman and leather worker. Another account says that his parents died and that he was adopted by an aunt. It is said that the aunt was very abusive to him and threw him into some fire or fireplace. Some say the prophet had a scar on his face because of this experience. Some accounts state that a Muslim master adept by the name of Jamal al-Din al-Ghani trying to teach a reformed branch of Islam called Islamism turned up in America around 1882 and that two Americans of African descent, Dr. Hijack, who are rumored to have studied under Olaf Ghani, were the parents of Prophet Noble Drew Ali. All right, so possible adoptive parents of the real uh, Thomas Drew. We're going to see. These are the people they might be referring to right here. But remember, Jamal is that so-called Egyptian sage he went to meet the master adept, who was Helen Blavatsky's master adept as well. We find accounts that Noble Drew Ali ran away from home and joined the circus and learned all types of mystical wisdom from gypsies. The word gypsy itself is derived from the word Egyptian, all right, from the true Egypt, Amarokka, probably as a prerogative because the true name of these people were Roma, based on the fact that Prophet Drew Ali was called Professor Drew the Egyptian adept, and that in those days a gypsy was called an Egyptian as a prerogative to mean a snake or salesman, and gypsies were usually found in circuses. Then we can conclude the origins of such a myth. Noble Drew Ali himself never expressed this according to any records or oral history, so we can call it what it is, a myth. According to one legend, Noble Drew Ali made a pilgrimage to North Africa where he studied with Moorish scholars and received a mandate from the King of Morocco to instruct Americans of African descent in Islam. One account said that he actually went to Arabia as well and passed the test of Khalifaship, successor, as noted in the Quran of Muhammad, for those coming as successors to the Prophet Muhammad. It is even rumored that the prophet went to the pyramid of Cheops and received initiation. Listen to this. This is where he was initiated to the secret society, the ancient order. And took the Muslim name Sharif Noble Abdul Ali. And that in America, he would be known as Noble Drew Ali because of such. This account states that on his return to the United States in 1913, he had a dream in which he was ordered to found a movement to uplift fallen humanity by returning the nationality, divine creed, and culture to persons of Moorish descent in the Western Hemisphere, all right? Matching almost a little bit what Malachi Jorg was saying. This author rejects the supposition that Prophet Noble Drew Ali took the name Sheikh Sharif Abdul Ali. There is not one document where this name is signed by the man himself, and we have many documents bearing his signature. The very people who espouse this pseudonym have yet to produce a document bearing this name, just like this author hasn't produced a document showing that he was born in North Carolina, but he just believed that, right? If there is some future document showing and proving such, this author will be first to tell, relay it to everyone. We believe it to be part of the pseudo lore used to sway followers away from the Moorish Science Temple of America and into other subversive Moorish organizations whose sole purpose is to keep this movement split. 
All right. So my intention is not that at all. You know, I've done videos on Christianity, some videos on hermetics and things like that. We're just talking about historical aspects of all this stuff. Again, this is not personal. We will touch on that particular aspect later on in this book. Some have even made claims that Prophet Noble Drew Ali was related to the empress of the Wachita group who claimed to be Moorish Indians. However, research by this author and speaking with brothers who was in that movement when it had its rise in the early 1990s has shown this claim to be erroneous and without any factual or documented merit. All right, so he's not related to her. Being that most of these accounts cannot be independently verified by this author, and it is reported that the prophet himself said, I didn't tell anyone where I was born or who my parents were because I didn't want people to make a shrine out of the place or make over my parents like was done with Joseph and Mary. I mean, right here, guys, he's literally comparing himself to Jesus. He's talking about Joseph and Mary. So this is a rebuttal that Thomas Drew used a lot when people ask him about his origins and his parents. Because you guys are going to see he's not from North Carolina. We hereby, for the sake of not creating any more exaggeration, must leave his childhood as a mystery. And maybe one day we will have that truth relate to us. Well, that day is today, guys. Again, I'm re-uploading something old. This is a mastered version. I got new info. I brought this out like four or five years ago. People took it very personal, got very upset, got disrespectful. But you got his own followers letting you know here that let's leave this as a mystery. They're okay with not knowing. They haven't really researched it. And they're saying maybe one day we'll have the truth. And hopefully we can go over the facts and not let our feelings involved now and allow me to present the information and, and be rational. With that, this is the best that we can give you on the early life of our prophet Noble Drew Ali as compiled from various sources, all appearing to be myths. What sources? There is no sources because they are myths. He's letting you know they are myths and these are their followers. These are myths. All right. So now we're going to go to this book. The book is called Islam in the African American Experience by Richard Brent Turner, Indiana University Press. It's from 1997. And we go to page 90 of this book. It says here, Noble Drew Ali and the Moorish Science Temple of America, Asiatic Identity. In these modern days, there came a forerunner who was divinely prepared by the great God Allah, and his name is Marcus Garvey who did teach and warn the nations of the earth to prepare to meet the common prophet, who was to bring the true and divine creed of Islam, and his name is Noble Drew Ali. All right, that was him literally saying that about himself. These words from Noble Drew Ali's Holy Quran indicate the importance of Marcus Garvey and the symbolism of Drew Ali's movement. And remember, Marcus Garvey is all about going back to Africa. Noble Drew Ali, the first self styled prophet of modern American Islam. Appropriate ideas and symbols not only from Garveyism, but also from the global religion of Islam, Freemasonry, remember, who's his master at it, Theosophy, just like Blavatsky, makes sense, Jamal of Ghani is the master at it, and 19th century Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanism. And although he lacked a formal education, he was a clever signifier who constructed an Asiatic racial separatist identity for his followers. Noble Drew Ali, whose birth name was Timothy Drew, was born in North Carolina on January 1886. Again, we're going to see if that's correct. Diverse legends have developed around his identity and activities before 1913. Again, here goes the legends, different stories. Some of his first followers claim that he was a child of ex-slayers raised among the Cherokee Indians. Another hypothesis claimed that he was a descendant of Bilali Muhammad, the famous African Muslim slave who inhabited Sapelo Island in the 19th century. He spent his early childhood as an orphan, wandering with a gypsy group, until he was spotted at the age of 16 by a gypsy woman who took him to Egypt, where he studied in the Isini schools. When he was a young man, about 16 years old, he returned to America where he became a merchant seaman based in Newark, New Jersey. Another legend claimed that Ali went back to Egypt in the early 20th century 
amid the last priests of an ancient cult of high magic. Talking about Jamal of Ghani. He proved that he was a prophet by finding his way out of the pyramids initiation. He was also taught to have traveled to Morocco and Saudi Arabia, where he obtained a charter from the sheikhs to teach Islam in America and received the name Ali from Sultan Abdul In said in Mecca. In 1910, he returned to the United States, where he worked as a train expressman and joined the Prince Hall Masons. He joined who? Prince Hall Masons. The final legend concerning his early years was that noble Drew Ali went to Washington, D.C. in 1912 to ask President Woodrow Wilson for the authority to teach his people Islam, the religion of their ancient forefathers. He also asked that the nationality, Moorish American, and the names of Ali, Bey, and El, and the flag of Morocco, which were taken away from his people in the colonial era, be given back. Perhaps closer to the truth than these legends is the Associated Negro Press's report that he, Ali, was accompanying a Hindu fakir in circus shows when he decided to start a little order of his own. All right, circus shows, a circus traveling magician. All right, so I just wanted to go over real quick. I want to show you everybody's telling you the same thing. It's all legends and myths of his origins. All right, so now we're going to move into the next part of the video where we're going to talk about facts and records we can actually verify about. This. All right, so now we're in this uh, article from the University of California, Riverside. It says, Noble Drew Lee in the Moorish Science Temple, a study in race, gender, and African-American religion, 1913 to 1930. This is a dissertation submitted in partial satisfaction of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and History by Steph Stephanie Ann Wilms. Now, if you research the history of Noble Drew Lee, right, you see that there's no census records, there's no, like, they don't know. And the story is basically a story that he's the son of he has like three different parents, according to the three different uh, views on it, right? Yeah, his birth and all that's a mystery. So there's another uh, factual information about a real person named actually Thomas Drew. All right. So now I want to show you this card here. It says Professor Drew, the Egyptian Arab student. Do you remember? He went to Egypt, circle story. He went to Egypt. He found an ancient Egyptian mystic cult. An ancient priest there gave him an initiation and then accepted him into his secret society. And then he came back and started doing everything he did, right? According to the oral testimonies of members of Moorish science, Noble Drew Ali first began his teachings as Professor Drew, Egyptian Arab student, and continued them through his organizing activities in the Canaanite temple. Although there is no date or citation available for the advertisement of Professor Drew, a World War I draft registration card from 12 September 1918 and the 1920 United States Census place a Thomas Drew, Thomas Drew, at the same address, at the same address. While the first name Thomas conf conflicts with previous accounts of Drew Ali as Timothy Drew, the information from the draft cards and census records suggest otherwise. You got to go with the census. What does it say in your genealogy, your census? The draft card from September 1918 reports that Thomas Drew was born 8 January 1886. This is the same year that Drew Ali was supposedly born. All right. This is a real person that they got here. Has the same birth date, the same date followers and historian cite as his birthday. And also cites him as a Negro man of medium height and built with black hair. Ultimately, Drew was disqualified for service in the war because the muscles on his forearm were badly burned. This physical feature of Drew Ali also parallels the uh, more Science Temple uh, father's stories of Drew's childhood. Their stories of his childhood, his, his childhood, right? Where he was cast into a fire by his aunt. The draft registration card also places Drew as a laborer for the submarine boat corporation in the port of New Jersey. As a laborer in the port, Drew would have come in con into contact with workers from different countries. So he was all around the world. Is that when he went into Egypt? Because he was in service. As the corporation at its peak employed 25,000 people. 
the sentence. This is a journal of race, ethnicity, and religion. It says before the fest, the life and times of Drew Ali. So again, journal of race and ethnicity and religion, volume five, issue eight, August, 2004. Stripping Ali from layers of cosmetically embellished folklore has resulted in the emergence of Thomas Drew. Thomas Drew, a gusty African-American who constantly reinvented himself from a struggling agricultural and port laborer in Norfolk and Richmond, Virginia, into Professor Drew, an oriental scientist before his final metamorphosis into noble Drew Ali, an Asiatic Muslim prophet in Newark, New Jersey, in the midst of Drew's evolution between 1886 and 1924, Thomas Drew reported to local board number seven in a public school in Bruce Street, Newark, New Jersey, on September 12, 1918, for the third draft registration for men aged between 18 and 45 as part of the volunteer cons conscripted American army to combat German troops in the Great War. Thomas Drew was drafted by the army, the real Thomas Drew. The illiterate, medium-built Virginian migrant struggled to complete his draft registration card, a most vital document to unveil Ali's enigmatic past. This is here, figure one, Thomas Drew, 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey, born January 8th, 1886. Noble Drew Ali, January 8th, 1886. Timothy Drew, early life. Several details of Drew Ali's early life are uncertain. They're uncertain. Why has it gotta be such a mystery? You think all this is coincidence? As true information became mixed with that of legend by his devout followers. We know that the truth is that he was named Thomas Drew. Three details in the draft card verified that Thomas Drew was the same person as Noble Drew Ali. Even though the former's first name Thomas and Virginia Roots challenged the commonly accepted belief that Ali was born Timothy Drew in North Carolina. First Thomas Drew's address listed as 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey. The dovetailed with the residents cited in Professor Drew, the Egyptian Adams advertising brochure. Same address, it's the same person. Same address, same person. We're going to see the figure. Second, Thomas Drew's birth date of January 8, 1886 coincided with Ali's birth date cited in the movie Religious Literature, Quran Questions, and his death certificate. Third, Thomas Drew's claim that his nearest relative was Uncle Ambrose Drew residing in Norfolk, Virginia, unearthed or the fragments of Ali's shrouded past. All right, so this is the figure they're talking about. This is Drew Ali's picture. It says, I am a Muslim, it says the Egyptian Arab student. He has 181 Warren Street, just like Thomas Drew, 181 Warren Street. What's going on here, man? Like, really? All these years and you never researched this. Coming through public records of Thomas Drew's Virginian parentage led to further discoveries, including a 1920 U.S. federal census record of Drew residing in 181 Warren Street, a federal census record. All right. Where's the census for Timothy Drew? Where is that census record that he was born in North Carolina? Cherokee parents. I want to see that. He's on the Dawes Rolls and all that. I want to see that. All right. So Thomas Drew... 1920 U.S. Federal Census record of Drew residing in 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey, working as a preacher on the public streets. Another was the 1900 U.S. Federal Census record revealing Drew's past as an African-American farmhand in Norfolk, Virginia, who was adopted, who was adopted, neatly paralleling Moorish folklore about a young Ali abandoned by his biological parents while devout Morris science temple followers would expectly be wary of embracing drew ali's demythologized past as thomas drew it would simultaneously be empirically be irrational for them to dismiss the symbiotic convergence between the pair of both shared a common surname racial group birthday literary literacy levels street address and religious occupation you know what they're saying right here? That's cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. We got the real one, Thomas Drew. Same person, Thomas Drew, a real person. Census record, a real person. Unveiling Ali's identity signifies a historiographical, yeah, breakthrough for researchers since th these discoveries yielded verifiable truths, including his actual birth name, origins, physical description, 
literacy levels, adopt their family structure, emigration patterns, employment records, and early religious experimentation. Secondly, understanding at least pre-1925 past acts as a useful historical tool to explain his ev evangelical success ahead of other proselytizing religious movements in the 1920s black urban America. While Ali played an Eastern personae as Allah, Asiatic prophet, Drew's distinctive African-American roots and common struggles bless him with a unique insight into the physique or psyche of and spiritual pulse of urban African-Americans in the competitive religious market. The competitive religious market. It's very competitive, the religious game. Okay, so let me read this part. It says, genealogy myths. So I haven't read this at all. It says, every year on the 8th of January, thousands of Moorish Americans throughout various temples commemorate Noble Drew Ali's birthday as encouraged by the Prophet himself. Celebrate my birthday, yo. January 8th. Celebrate my birthday. Invite your Asiatic friends to come out and enjoy it with you. Yes, bring out your baskets of food to the temple and banquet them, in, you know, in my honor. Paradoxically, in the midst of prior revelry, the faithful has remained obscure about concrete details of their founder's birth. The blurring of lines between fact and fantasy was enhanced further as several leaders romanticized the event as divinely cosmological one, advocated that on Ali's birthday, an earthquake took place, symbolizing the arrival of a lost prophet on earth. In likelihood, Ali himself encouraged such legends as re-encountered by brother I. Cook Bay, that an eclipse took place in the rural community where the prophet was born. When I was born, it turned black dark in the daytime. The people put their hose down and came out into the fields. While these glorious accounts of Ali's miraculous birth were designated to authenticate his religious leadership, contemporary Moorish Americans continue to cling on to such mythological narratives of Ali's unproven genealogy, unproven genealogy, parentage, and upbringing in North Carolina. However, the newly discovered materials attesting that Ali was born Thomas Drew on January 8, 1886 in Virginia, United States, before he was adopted, went against the grain of Moorish dogmatic beliefs regarding his first name, parentage, racial genealogy, and birthplace. Ali's deliberate masquerading of his origins with an Eastern mask was not the work of a con artist, but rather a skillful proselytizer who, A, adroitly crafted an oriental image comprehensible and alluring to his audience deftly blanket his lineage out of more science temple of america literature and realigned it to more divine genealogical heritage c selected delicate shards of his painful past and weaved them into trans more griffith prophet-like tropes and d ingeniously connected his broken famil fam familial past with his present demands as a prophet by extracting relevant chapters of oriental literature and weaving them into Moorish sacred texts. Ali's first name, Thomas, was never reflected in Moorish literature that simply listed their prophet as Noble Drew Ali. Hence, nobody within the community was actually aware of Ali's first name. The first member utilized the name Timothy Drew was Aaron Payne L. When filing Ali's death certificate on July 25, 1929, while it could be argued that Payne was privy to Ali's early identity as a close aide, Payne L's Fealty to Ali should not be overplayed as his rise in the Moorish ranks as Supreme Business Manager was belated in February 1929, and he quickly excited the movement for a political career. In likelihood, Payne depended on newspaper articles written by investigative journalists who portrayed Ali as a doppelganger who mutilated his first names Timothy Drew, El Eli Drew, and John Drew. The truth that Ali was born Thomas Drew and consistently used his birth name on official documents as late as 1920 before disguising his true identity because he was a Moorish Asiatic Great Gatsby who suppressed his impoverished origins with more ostentatious Eastern personage to inflate his aura of religious grandeur in an appealing comprehensible fashion to black audience who associated Drew's symbolic connections to Egypt and Morocco with their own yearning for affluent abundance and spiritual truth in 1920s. America. So while Ali masked his first name, he also consciously retained his surname, Drew, through his various identity variations, suggesting a desire to retain slivers of his past. This calculated gesture to anchor his Eastern identity to a distinctively American heritage enhanced the effectiveness of his Moorish evangelical crusades. As the unique Eastern American formula reassured potential converts interested in embracing a new Moorish Muslim identity, 
that a conversion did not entail complete severing of courts to their family and American root. Drew's historical records corroborated the myths concerning Ali's parentage and adoption. Ali's standard childhood nar nar narratives posited that he was adopted by an abusive aunt after his biological father mysteriously disappeared and his mother passed away. So mysterious, all these mysteries. This perfectly blended with the 1900 census where Thomas was adopted and raised by an African-American couple, James Washington Drew and Lucy Drew. He was adopted by these people. 1900 census is telling you that. And as early as 1898, when Ali was 12 years old, Thomas' relationship to the head of the household was listed as Adip's son. As his adoptive parents, or adoptive son, right? As his adoptive parents took him into their residence in 411 Princess Anne Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia. Moreover, Lucy Drew was listed as having eight children, of whom only two were living, referring to her biological daughters, Adi Drew and Brini Drew. But the adopted Thomas was not included in his statistical classification. The Drew's adoption of Ali was most likely di dictated by financial considerations to supplement the meager family income, constituting of James' salary as common laborer and Lucy's wages as laundress. This empirical discovery of Ali's adoption explains the curious silence on Ali's biological lineage in the Moorish religious text simply because Drew knew very little of his biological parents. For inquisitive followers who questioned him on his genealogy, Ali deflected the request by instead offering an apocryphal explanation. I didn't tell anyone where I was I, I born or who my parents were because I didn't want people to make a shrine out of the place or make make over my parents like what was done with Joseph and Mary. But he's calling himself Jesus. Ali's response illustrated his proselytizing genius in blanketing his past while simultaneously advancing his cause as a divine prophet by associating his biological parents with revered biblical figures Joseph and Mary. Convinced of Ali's divine lineage, even top uh, Morris Science Temple of America officials remain unaware of his true lineage. In completing Ali's death certificate, Aaron Payne simply scrawled unknown in sections requesting Ali's parents' names and birthplaces. In 1942, Charles Kirkman Bay, Ali's in linguistic translator, could not respond to FBI agents' interrogation on Ali's parentage. If Noble Drew Ali was born in North Carolina and you travel all over the United States, did you ever check birth records to determine who his parents were? Still the new So we're going to continue with the video here. So I'm going to show you guys some genealogical records of Thomas Drew now that you know his real name and who he really is. I'm going to confirm what we just read. I'm going to show you the actual records. I built the tree and I'm going to show you how mysterious he still is, even though we know his adoptive parents. Everything is still a mystery. So these are his supposed adoptive siblings. I'm going to show you who they are. We're going to go into Thomas Drew, a.k.a. Timothy. So again, he was born in Norfolk, Virginia, January of 1886. What do we have here? We have a 1900 census. In 1900, Thomas Drew was four, about 14. Birthplace, Virginia. Relationship to head, adopted son. Who's in the household? We have James Drew, Lucy Drew, Thomas Drew. Going into the census, you can guys can see James Drew, Lucy, and we got Thomas right here, and it does say adopted son. Birthplace, Virginia. Parents, Virginia, Virginia. Nine about North Carolina. We continue, we got a census from 1920. The 1920 one is saying he's around 34 years old. He's living in Newark. New Jersey now, right? He's a boarder living under somebody. Louis Gaines, it says. Might be paying rent to her. He's single. An occupation is preacher. So just to go into the census, all right, so you guys can see. Louise Gaines. We got Thomas Drew. And once you see this, you can't deny that this Thomas Drew is Noble Drew Ali. Why is that? We go to the part where it says occupation, and it says preacher in public streets remember he even said that and we already know he was a preacher in public streets this is in 1920 before he had gone to chicago to establish his more science temple of america what are the coincidences that this thomas drew happens to have the same exact birthday as noble drew ali and is also a preacher in public streets so i hope you guys do not 
keep practicing cognitive dissonance. This is the real noble Drew Ali. He is from Virginia. Another census letting you know Virginia. And this is all the way in New Jersey. So why would they put Virginia specifically? They had to have known. He might have told them. Somebody informed the census taker. But they put Virginia. Just like the 1900 census says he was born in Virginia. So another thing I want to show you guys is his World War I draft uh, registration card, which we talked about already. You guys can see it's Thomas Drew under address that says 181 Warren Street, right? Birth date, January 8th, 1886. Thomas Drew, 181 Warren Street. 181 Warren Street. And just so we can confirm again that it's Noble Drew Ali, let's go look at Noble Drew Ali's Egyptian student added ID card. Again, Professor Drew, the Egyptian added student. Noble Drew Ali, right? Look at the address, 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey. 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey. Let's go back to Thomas Drew. Back at the military registration card, Thomas Drew. Again, 181 Warren Street. Same person. So again, we go back to the 1920 federal census. Thomas Drew from Virginia, not North Carolina, is living in where? Warren Street. Warren Street. Just like Professor Drew, the Egyptian addict, living in 181 Warren Street. It's the same person. Do you see? Do you clearly see? Do you clearly see? So real quick, we go to uh, this uh, reading right here from JSTOR. It's the Handbook of Islamic Sects and Movements. We're in Chapter 29, The Moorish Science Temple of America. This is by Fatih Ali Abdad, pages 673 to 693. And we're getting into the introduction of the article. Most literature on the founding prophet of the Moorish Science Temple of America, Noble Drew Ali, has either treated his murky origins cursorily or hagiographically, exaggerated and romanticized his roots, all right, exaggerated earthquakes, eclipse, virgin births, yeah, they even said that. Recent fortuitous discoveries of Drew's pre-Moorish documents have enabled historians to reconstruct a more empirical count of the Moorish prophet. While tampering with Drew's legacy could open a Pandora's box with unforeseen circumstances that would bring no discernible benefit to contemporary Moorish American sheikhs, the MSTA Leite deserves knowledge of its genuine historical past, unencumbered from crudely constructed myths. All right, you guys really want to know the truth. Newly unearthed census and city records disclose that dogmatic MSTA narrations on Drew's genealogical roots were specious. Drew Ali was born Thomas Drew, all right? That's his real name. Another person letting you know on January 8th, 1886 in Norfolk, Virginia, not North Carolina. By 1898, he was adopted by James Washington Drew, and Lucy Drew, all right? Not John Washington Drew. There is no John Washington Drew. I see a lot of people trying to add John Thompson Drew, a Cherokee chief, which was born in the 1700s, so he couldn't be his dad as the same person as James Washington Drew, which we just saw was his adoptive dad, and Lucy Drew, his adoptive mom. And I'm still not sure if they're his blood relatives or if this is the evil aunt. He might not even be a Drew, guys. He literally might be adopted by these people, and they might have given him the surname. An African-American couple resided in 411 Princess Anne Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia. And that was on the 1900 census we saw. As a teenager, the illiterate Drew worked as a common laborer, rural farmhand, and wharf longshoreman in the southern port city to supplement his adopted parents' wages. However, like many black Norfolk laborers, the Drews were paid little and could not catapult themselves into the black Borges class. As such, Drew explored new prospects in other cities, 
applying his trade first as a porter in Richmond, Virginia in 1916, and then as a shipyard laborer for the submarine boat corporations in Newark, New Jersey, answering America's call in the industrial war effort. On September 12, 1918, Drew reported to a public school in Bruce Street, Newark, New Jersey, for the third draft registration as part of the volunteer conscripted American Army in the Great War. A routine medical examination revealed badly burned forearm muscles. United States World War I draft registration card. All right, that's the one we had and we just saw. And Drew subsequently filled the criteria for induction. After World War I, the company folded, leaving Drew unemployed. In large part, between 1916 and 1923, Drew resided in 181 Warren Street. Again, 181 Warren Street, Newark, New Jersey, together with Louisa Gaines, a married Virginian in a mixed neighborhood. Drew alternated between working in a barbershop and a street preacher. For the latter, Drew attired himself in a loosely fitted multicolored gown, covered his head with a brilliant purple hood, and cosmetically redesigned himself as Professor Thomas Drew, the Egyptian Arab student, an East Indian from Virginia who ate nails and cured blind soldiers. His vast clientele sought him for a wide range of services including crystal gazing all right like a magician advice on love affairs and eastern wisdom such as the forgotten 18 years of jesus christ live all right just like we went over on my last video more than half of the circle seven quran is the writings of levi dowling's aquarian gospels of jesus swiftly he emerged as black newark's leading faith healer amidst the crowded and competitive religious marketplace of seers, mystics, palmists, professors, and princes who taught mystical sciences since the turn of the 20th century. At this juncture, Drew was still unfessed, unaffiliated to a Moorish lineage, but had already fashioned himself as true Orientalist Muslim. Nevertheless, during this phase, Drew fell afoul of the law several times and was arrested for illegally peddling medicine. Despite trumpeting messianic claims of his ability to bend prison bars, Newark's federal penitentiary successfully quarantined Professor Drew physically in the late 1910s and early 1920s. Yet prison walls failed to totally circumscribe Muslim teachers in Newark as another enigmatic figure took Drew's position to further fan the flame of esoteric folk Islam in the community. With Drew's religious preaching and abeyance, Abdul Hamid Suleiman, here we go, Suleiman again, a Sudanese immigrant, filled the mantle as a charismatic spiritual leader serving numerous colored community. Suleiman founded an extremely successful Canaanite temple, a black Mohammedan Masonic movement that operated in various cities, including one of, at the corner of Bank and Rogers Streets, Newark a mere three miles from his residence. In April 1923, the popularity of Suleiman's Canaanite temple spectacularly nosedived when Suleiman and his assistant, Muhammad Ali, and this is most likely Wali Bard, were charged and arrested by the Supreme Court of New Jersey for carnal abuse of a follower's child. That's a whole other story right there. But... I just wanted to go ahead and show you, this is again for another video, Suleiman's involvement in the Canaanite Temple is more than what they have said. Amidst the leadership vacuum, Professor Drew reinvented himself as a religious prophet by deliberately suffixing the powerful surname Ali that concomitantly connected him to three important sources of authority in the minds of black urban masses, Caliph Ali, the imagined founding father of masonry, and son-in-law of Islamic prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, Dus Muhammad Ali, an inspirational Pan-Africanist, Garveyite intellectual, and the incarcerated Muhammad Ali, local organizer for the Canaanite Temple. As Canaanite Temple No. 1 had legally been incorporated in Newark in May 1924, Drew embarked on an evangelical crusade elsewhere under a new Moorish banner to restructure Suleiman's satellite temples 
and traveled to several southern cities before establishing his headquarters at Chicago, Illinois in 1925. All right. So I'm going to end it right there because this is going right into the next uh, portion of you know these studies when it comes to uh, Drew Ali. We're going to be talking about Suleiman, true involvement in the Canaanite temple. It was three people who created this. And Suleiman played a bigger role in creating the Canaanite temple than Drew Ali. But this is where we're going to end this uh, video right here. I hope you guys see. I hope it's clear to you guys who... Noble Drew Ali really is. It's Thomas Drew from Virginia. Now, after seeing all the information, if you still want to, you know, believe what you want to believe, I can respect that. This is for people who go with information and not just beliefs. And hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, this ain't personal. I got nothing but love for everybody. I didn't write any of these reports or books or any of these scholarly articles. It's not me saying it. And the historical records and the genealogy don't lie. Apart from all the myths and legends, there is a real story behind this person. And that's all I'm trying to show you guys. So thanks for tuning in once again. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow. Robert Dre.